they learned probably six, seven years prior to that they had kidney disease. But what they don't tell you, and I learned later, is kidney disease for men is much more accelerated than it is in women. Welcome to another episode of the Matt Overmind Experience. I'm your host, master trainer and weight management expert, Narado Zico Powell. And I have today on the show, Gregory S. Works. We have some good stuff to talk about because he's the author of a really awesome book called Triumph. And Gregory has a very unique story, which I think most people can really learn and benefit from. I mean, this man has been exposed to kidney disease for over a third of his life and a recipient of two kidney transplants. So he's going to tell us about his story, what he has gone through, what he's going through, but not all of that, give us some really good tips to overcome the struggles that we may face in our lives. Because think about it, right? Everybody faces struggles. No matter who you are, no matter how smart you may think you are, no matter how rich you may be, we all face struggles, but we don't spend enough time talking about how we can overcome them and not be a slave to the things that we go through in our lives. So we have a lot of good stuff to talk about. And of course, it's going to be a nice hack of the episode because Gregory is going to tell us what he expects us to learn from the things that he has gone through. So stick around and get ready for this really powerful episode. And with that being said, Gregory, welcome to the show, my man. Hey, thanks, Zico. Really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and interview me. Thank you for being here, my friend. And with that being said, let's just dive right into this puppy. You wrote your book, Triumph, because of stuff you've gone through. So tell us a little bit about your story and then what really drove you to write your book. Well, you know, uh, I'm going to start out with uh, what drove me to write my book, and then I'll circle back on the other question. Um, what, what really wrote me to write my book is I saw an unmet need out there. Uh, I recognized that as I was go walking through my journey, uh, I would have loved to have had a book that actually spoke to the things that I was looking at throughout my process and what I was actually uh, trying to move forward with. You know, real question is, my goal was to want, I wanted to make sure that I had the ability to help others navigate a health challenge. And for me, that was pretty significant. I mean, I had a couple of people. I had my mother had kidney disease. I had another good partner of mine that had kidney disease. And that's who I spoke to. But for you to be able to sit back and read a book that speaks to, well, how do I go about treating kidney disease? Is it through a transplant? Is it through dialysis? Uh, how do I go, go about trying to identify who are going to be the, uh, the donors? Uh, you know, how do I make that put together that list? You go through the highs and lows as you're trying to figure that stuff out. You know, how do you handle when someone um, responds to you negatively? I remember the first time I had someone tell me something that was negative, you know, told me that they couldn't do it. And I had spoken to a one woman at church that day and she said, Greg, how are you going to handle no? Uh, so just getting these pieces of these, these bits and uh, nuggets of knowledge are real, real key as it relates to how you should actually try to approach this thing. Uh, another piece that I say is time, your time is sensitive. This is a time sensitive matter. Remember when you're trying to have, uh, you're trying to get a kidney, some people wait a year, some people wait two years, three years, some people wait six years, you know? Uh, and the objective is you're trying to get one as soon as possible because guess what? Something could happen to one of your other organs and you may have some challenges as it relates to that. For me, this, when I had my second kidney transplant, I didn't think I was going to be able to have that because they were telling me that I was having issues with prostate, potentially prostate cancer. So if I had to have prostate, if I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, that would have meant that I would have had to have that surgery completed before I could have a surgery to do a transplant. And they're looking at two to three years. By this time, I may have had other organs that were failed. So this is definitely time sensitive. But the biggest driver for me for writing this book was after I had my first kidney transplant and probably day two, I was walking around the ward. I had my IV machine with me 
And I was doing laps around the ward and I was doing real good. And the nurses were encouraging me and said, hey, Mr. Works, uh, keep, keep it up. You're doing a great job. Keep going, keep going. And I was on the transplant ward. So there were other people there that had liver, uh, had liver transplants, kidney transplants, other transplants. And I'm, as I'm passing the room, I'm not seeing anybody get out of their room. And then I came back to the room and I just broke down in tears because I knew at that point that God had his hand on me. I knew that what was happening may not be normal, but was normal for me, but a lot of people weren't going through that and didn't have what I would consider that favor of God. And at that point in time, I said, you know what, God, whatever you ask me to do, I will do. I never thought it was to write a book, but here we are, you know, 2009 is when I had that transplant and we're 2023. That's 14 years. It took me a long way to get here, but I'm here now. And I believe that what I put together on paper is something that will help people all over the country and also has the impact other people all over the world, because this isn't an American issue. This is an issue that's global that people deal with. So that, that gives you, I think, a pretty good example or basically the reason in terms of why I wanted to write this book and it's writing the book for the people. As you sit back and say the story, well, when I look at the, my, my story, it's not necessarily unique as it relates to getting kidney transplants, but kidney disease runs in my family. For me, I wasn't surprised when I learned that I had kidney d- disease, but it's just how it came about. I was just went went and had a had a routine, uh, a routine uh, physical, and when I came out of that physical, the doctor uh, came back. He got the results and he saw some things that he didn't look particularly care for, and he said, "I want you to go see a specialist." And I went and saw, saw the specialist and came back and we looked at the records, and he said, "You know, you have these small cysts that are surrounding your kidney." And he knew immediately that I had what you call polycystic kidney disease, which is disease that's hereditary in my family. At this point, uh, I was, what, 39, 40 years old. And I was the last person in my family to actually learn that I had kidney disease. Uh, My sisters that are twins that are a couple of years uh, younger than I, they learned probably six, seven years prior to that they had kidney disease. But what they don't tell you, and I learned later, is kidney disease for men is much more accelerated than it is in women. And when I say that, once I got that diagnosed, my need to have it treated had to happen much quicker than when my sisters had to have the opportunity to get their treated. So let me fast forward to, as I, as I explain my story, and you sit back and say, well, how would you respond if one week you learned your wife was pregnant with your first child, two weeks later, you, you go into the office, you, have a, you, you, you meet with the folks from the transplant unit, you don't necessarily know why you're there, but after you sit down and meet with five, six, seven different you know, specialists, everything ranging from surgeons to nurses to finance directors to social workers, to nutritionists, and then the doctor comes out and says, Mr. Works, do you know your blood type? And my question as I look at him is, why do you, why do you want to know? And he said, well, we've been studying your case for a long time, and if you had a kidney today, we would operate on you immediately. So at that juncture, my jaw dropped. My eyes got big and I didn't really know what to say. I didn't know what, how to respond. I just got finished sitting down talking to folks and one, the finance director told me that, you know, the transplant cost could be anywhere from $250,000 to $400,000. So you're asking yourself, well, how can you pay for this? He also shared with me at that point in time that 80% could be covered through Medicaid. But what's 80% of $400,000? That's still $80,000. That's a lot of paper. That's a lot of money that you're working with. So I was dumbfounded. The other thing 
that was going on in the struggle that I was working with is I was working for a big four consulting firm and my, my firm was going through financial straits. I had no idea whether or not we were even going to be afloat. So I'm sitting here trying to figure out one, how, how am I going to pay, pay, pay for baby girl or baby boy that's go, is on the way? Two, how am I going to, how am I going to get a kidney, uh, a, a kidney? I don't even know how to even approach it. Hadn't even thought about it. And then the third thing is, I might not even have any money to cover this. So there was a lot going on in a short period of time. And fortunate for me, I, I sat down, I developed a plan, identified people to, uh, to ask them would they be interested in, uh, and not only just interested, but would they be willing to help me have the opportunity to live a normal life by, by them donate, getting tested and donating the kidney to me. And then eventually, fast forward, my daughter is born. My first daughter is born. Two months after that, I end up having my first kidney transplant. And the day I walk back in that job, my company filed for Chapter 11. That's a powerful story. And I was sitting here thinking about, man, and I have these questions that I really want to ask, but now I'm going to veer a little bit because I think there's some stuff we need to unpack here that can really be beneficial to the watchers, right? <laughs> so I want to ask you, like, because a lot of times we try to focus on the good things, which is good. We should focus on the positive. That's definitely true. But outside of the end result, there are a lot of things that happen in that time that get you to that end result, right? There are times when you have your lows. We just feel like you just can't do this anymore, right? So tell us about some of those moments. Like, did you have any of those moments where you're like, oh man, you know what? I got, I still have to pay $80,000. I have to ask people to get tested. You know, my with my children, everything that's going, I, I, my, my daughter come to the world and my job. Like, what was, any, any, any struggles that you remember that was kind of going on in your mind at the time? Let, let me give you the first struggle that I really had. You know, I, 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 ch I struggled with this. You know, I work in business development and sales. So I'm not unaccustomed to hearing the word no. So as I'm asking people to donate, I know I'm going to hear some yeses, I'm going to hear some noes, but I was just shocked when I heard my first no. And it, it came to me, and it came to me from a very close friend. I didn't question it. I just kind of moved on. But what God showed me another six to nine months was why he didn't respond. He respond, respond positively. And at the end of the day, what I didn't know was that, and I didn't really realize was he was the primary breadwinner for his whole family. I'm not talking about for him, his wife, his kids, but I'm also talking about his extended family as ter ter in, in terms of his father, uh, his wife, and also his nieces and nephews. And he had a, uh, his, his sister ended up passing away in the middle of this. And then subsequently, He's picking up the brunt of what's actually going on. But that for me was a low as I sat back and so watched what he went through. Uh, another major low is, as I said before, everything is time sensitive here. So I, but my, one of my bosses told me, he said, Greg, it's, he said, what I need you to do is I need you to win. But if you lose, I need you to lose early. So. What I'm saying here is this thing in terms of trying to get identified don donor is a numbers game. So as it relates to it, I need you to say yes or no quick so I can move on to the next person as people are getting tested. But when I have someone that just strings me along or kind of goes AWOL, that becomes problematic. And that for me was a, was a major low. I mean, I had some friends that did it. I had some family members that did it. And my siblings took my family members to task, you know? It's like, hey, you know, let's not blame it on this person or that person, the other person. We need you to tell us yes or no. But one of the, one of the times this ha happened, I had somebody I was talking to pretty much on a regular basis. And he went AWOL on me for like three or four months. So that was problematic for me when I sit back and look at, you know, a low. Uh, I would say another low that uh, 
that I experienced was as I was uh, as I sit back and look at this is I learned a lot about a lot of people throughout this process. And that's to me is positive because you just want to know who's with you. At the end of the day, you know, want to know who's got your back, who's in this. You know, it's almost like in some respects, it's almost like you're going to war, you're going to battle. And you want to know who's on your right and your left and whether or not they got your back, regardless of what's actually happening. So those are some of what I would consider some of the, uh, the lows uh, that I actually experienced. But I learned a great deal throughout that process. There's, of course, you know, and my viewers and listeners know that I grew up in Jamaica, right? And so I love reggae music and especially like traditional old school reggae music that I can play. And uh, one of my favorite songs from an artist called Luciano, and it says, a friend in need is a friend indeed. Like, I'll never forget that song. Like, you know, because when your back is against the wall, that's when you really know who has your back, who's really there for you, right? And I couldn't just only imagine what was going on in your mind throughout this entire ordeal, which then, le then leads me to my next question, right? Because we talked about your business and um, how you basically your business was going on there during that time frame. So with all these highs and lows going on and then facing, like, how did you even face the fact that you financially, your business may be going on there and financially you're going to struggle as well? Well, it's, it, you know, it wasn't my personal business, but it was my business, business on the job. Um, I, I knew that I had resources. Fortunately, I knew that I had resources to address the need if I, if I had to address the need. So that was the one piece that was, uh, that was positive. But for me, I was on a different path as it relates to what you just, what you just shared, because I had people coming to me after my company was on its way out, you know, going about to go, the company going under, asking me, what were my plans? What I, did I intend on doing? Uh, but I didn't really hear the question. And what they were really asking me is, would you be interested in going into business with me? Would you be interested in doing these things? But at the time, sit back and think about it. It's like, okay, I had a transplant. I got one child here. And the most important thing to me was health care. I needed to make sure that my family was covered. So I couldn't be looking, you know, for to go out and try to do something on my own at that point in time. Because I needed to make sure that my daughter, I could put food on the table for my daughter. The other thing is my wife was already out on her own. So the insurance was on me. Everything was on me, you know. So I needed to make sure that I found another job so that I could take care of the family. Uh, but I, you know, different time, I may have tried to, tried to go out and do something my own and, and work with some of these other people because I had the relationships, the people that we were sitting down talking to. But at that point in time, there was no way that I could even focus because the only thing I heard them say is the only thing I could, I could think about was I need to make sure that I can take my daughter to the doctor and she's covered, you know, and if something happened to my wife, because the thing that's interesting about all this is within 15 months of me having my first child, I had my second child. So I didn't know that was in play at the time, <laughs> but I'm, th I'm just trying to think ahead. Did that, does that answer your question? No, that definitely did. That definitely did. Because I mean, you know, it's interesting with someone who has their own business, like, like, but we don't realize that how how many benefits it, that comes with actually working for someone else, right? right? But in your unique situation, when you're talking about your wife and then you're having your second child and then trying to deal with the transplant and then your highs and lows, that's a lot of stuff, man. That's like a whole lot of stuff to kind of like to, in, to internalize and then try to turn into something positive. Right. So, I mean, that's absolutely huge. I can, I could only, you described what was going on in your mind, but I could only really imagine what was actually happening inside of you, you know? So, I mean, you're, I'm sure you heard this before. You're like, you're a really strong individual. Your strength, I could say, com comes from God, you know, like, and, and, you know, it's, so that's, the, the, I want people as they're listening to kind of trying to grasp their minds around, look, I'm going through a lot of stuff. 
And, you know, but no matter what I'm going through, there are ways out of it. And we're going to, the next two questions, we're going to dive into that. We're going to talk about some of the lessons that you learned, right? And then we're also going to talk about like what people can take away for their personal life. So that's going to be like the next two questions I'm going to get into. But before I do that, I'm going to give my man Gregory a little break here, right? Because I want to talk. <laughs> You know, I want to talk about one of my favorite companies. I want to talk about the Amino Co. I want to talk about Perform, right? Because the Amino Co. products, their EAAs at 100% science backed, built on amino acid technology that was first funded by NASA and then further refined through rigorous research and independent clinical trials, right? So, yes, I'm talking about a form, Perform, an EAA product that's designed to improve muscle performance during exercise. Enhance mental clarity and concentration, which seems like I need some mental clarity right now. Reduce fatigue and dehydration and minimize recovery times, right? So what is this perform? I always tell, I tell people it's, it's a blend of essential aminos, not branch chain aminos, but essential aminos. It also has creatine, right? And we know that creatine has been studied for mental and physical performance. Like there's so many creatine that's been around forever, but a lot of people don't use it in their training. It's a very essential part, especially if you're weightlifting, right? It's very important. And because of the create the blend of essential aminos and creatine, it only has about 60 milligrams of caffeine. So I drink it like a pre-workout. I should drink it before I go to the gym. Right. And I don't have to load up on 200 and 300 milligrams of caffeine. And something else I love about Perform, because not just, there is yes, there's the physical benefits of the essential aminos and there's the creatine. And um, and of course, the caffeine that my body uses really, really well for my workout. But something else I love about it, they have all natural flavors. You know, I've talked about health, right? So they have all natural flavors that's not loaded with sugar. We got like a lot of these pre-workouts are. So I absolutely love it. But again, it's not just a pre-workout because it has the essential aminos. It has the creatine. So it gives, it gives your body what it needs for you to perform better in your workouts, which is essential to build muscle and burn fat. But enough of me just talking about that. Let me tell you about some of these trials that I love to read off, right? 20% increase in exercise completed, 22% increase in endurance, 11% increase in peak performance during exercise, and 10% improvement in cognitive function during exercise. That's just some of the benefits you can get from Perform. So check it out. I absolutely love it. If I recommend it, it's because I use it and I absolutely love it. The website is aminoco.com Zico Health. And guess what? Click on the website, you get 30% off their fantastic products. Not just Perform, but even Heal, which is not a product that, that I talk about on the show from the Amino Co, right? So I'll make sure that the website is below the description of the episode. So you can click on it. And by the way, if you do, you see this handsome face just staring right back at you. <laughs> and you get 30% off. Look at that. Look at that, right? Some people say I'm full of myself and it's probably true. But with that being said, <laughs> I'm bringing Gregory back on the show. He's, he's quickly <laughs> learning that, you know, I'm, I'm a little crazy in the brain, but I'm looking, Gregory, I gave you a break and now he's back for you. I want to talk about you. It's all about you, man. It's all about your story. So tell us this, you told us some of the things kind of hint on some of the stuff you learned. So tell us, what are some things that you really learned or some big lessons you can think about during this entire situation? <laughs> So as I sit, sit back and think about what I learned is, and what I will share with you and your audience is, assess your challenges like it's a business problem. Assess your challenges like it's a business problem. For me, I had to sit back and say, well, I learned that I had a kidney disease. I learned that, that this, this disease was something that I was gonna have to live with for the rest of my life. But the question was, how are we going to treat it? What are my options that are actually out there? How do we go about this? So for me, as soon as we learned that I had kidney disease, I had the opportunity to go to a very good hospital uh, in the state of Maryland. But it wasn't the best hospital in the state of Maryland. And my wife and I sat down and talked. She said, you know what? Uh, Let's see if we can't get you the best. So she, she got on the phone and started making phone calls. And she was able to get up an appointment with, uh, with a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor, uh, at Johns Hopkins Hospital at Johns Hopkins University. 
which is arguably the top hospital in the country, let alone one of the top in the world. And, and that's where we started. And as I sat down with them, we began to develop a plan. One of the plans was um, the doctor said, Greg, we're not going to, we're, we're going we're gonna to get a hold of this. I'm going to monitor you. But my plan is that you never have to go on dialysis, at least for this first transplant. He said, we are going to jump on top of this. So that was the plan. She said, you know, I'm going to monitor you. We're going to see what happens. But she wanted me to begin starting to think about if I needed a transplant. As she said, one day you may need one. I didn't think so. But she's like, I needed to begin trying to determine who are the people that I was going to ask. And that was probably the first big decision that I needed to make in terms of approach. But I was approaching it like it was a business problem that we had to solve. The second piece of this, as I shared with me before, is I knew it was time sensitive. And I just say this because anything can happen. So just wanted to make sure that as I was trying to move forward and I was asking people, I needed to get responses quickly. Uh, so I focused on trying to do that. The third piece of this is, you know, who do you look at first? I looked at my family. Well, for me, on my on my uh, on my mother's side of the family, the majority of my family members had some sort of health challenge that they were going through, and a number of them actually had had kidney disease, so they were no longer an option. So, I jumped to my father's side of the family. Well, my father, you know, being from from the south, big family. He was the youngest of, what, 11, 12. So with that, I'm the youngest of all of my, my first cousins. So all my cousins got the own health issues going on. So that piece right there made me have to pivot real quickly. And then I jumped to, my, and then I jumped to the, the, the guys that were, the brothers that were in my wedding. But that's how I went about trying to identify who I was going to target for my kidney. Uh, the next thing I said is, uh, this is a numbers game. So I just, I knew I had to be quick. Uh, and I also wasn't going to get bent out of shape based on uh, whether or not they said yes or no. I just, I just had to move on. I had to get it in my mind, look, get over it why they said no. Uh, but guess what? That's their, you know, that's my issue. That's not their issue. I'll get over it, but let's move forward. And as I said before, lose fast, you know. If you, if, you, if you get to who you're trying to identify quickly, you know, and things don't drag out, things begin to happen for you. In some respects, it's almost like when you're young and you're dating, you know, you're trying <laughs> people date a lot of different people all throughout the time. But at some point, they're going to identify that one and they move and they just focus. So I had to look at it in that kind of light in terms of how I approach this process of trying to get a kidney. But this was significant as what was one of the things that learned. The other piece I will, I will share with you is I am a man of faith and God and faith were really my foundation of uh, how I was able to continue to move forward, persevere, as well as overcome. I learned about the power of prayer. I had a prayer partner, a guy that I actually prayed with probably three times a week. We prayed about a whole lot of things, and this was just one of the things that we prayed for. But I had a brother that I had the ability to walk with, talk with, and be there side by side as I was going through this journey. And then naturally, I had other people that were praying for me. I didn't even know they were praying for me, you know? But as I sit back and look at that, I mean, that's key for me as it relates to, you know, kind of my learning. Also, as we as we sit back and look at learning, I learn learn how do you approach your employer? You know, a lot of things you do on a need to know basis. When I had my first transplant, one of my bosses was aware that I had some health challenges, but I confided in another one that I wasn't working for, and he shared with me, as I shared with you wait to the last minute 
before you share other things with people because you don't necessarily know how you're going to treat, treat it. You don't know whether or not they're going to and, and whether or not they may end up playing with your money. Uh, we don't even know whether or not they still want you to even be here. And I've seen that throughout the process. And I also had to get over the fact, recognize that it's not personal. It's just business. You know, people want to be able to work with people that have the ability to put points on the board. And if you can't put points on the board, you're a liability to them. So recognize, you know, everybody's not for you. Everybody is not for you. So it, for, for me, you know, you, you got to begin to learn. You got to be selfish about this thing. You know, this is this is you. This is your livelihood. And you got to be selfish because there's other people that are counting on you. And that leads me to the big question then, right? Because you just told us all these lessons that you learned during this time. But if you're talking to someone that's struggling and going through something and just doesn't know what to do next, from what you've experienced, what's that one thing you would tell that person? You know, the, the, probably the biggest thing I would tell them is when life hits you between the eyes with a major health challenge or any challenge, don't let the moment overwhelm you. You need to step back and not react, but try to gain an understanding in terms of what happened, what you just heard, and how you're going to actually approach this. Because at the end of the day, your response is what really matters, you know. And recognize whatever happened is probably temporary. You know, do not make a permanent situation based on hearing something that's emotional. You cannot do that. But for me, it was don't let the moment overwhelm me. And I sat back and I looked at what was transpiring and I didn't panic. I mean, for a minute, I was sitting back and after I knew what to do, I wasn't moving. And I had a friend that basically kicked me in my behind and gave me a few choice words. And then I jumped on it. But I had to sit back and try to begin to embrace and understand what was actually going on. But that's the, that's the one thing that I see a lot of people don't do is when they get hit between the eyes, they just respond and react and they become emotional. But you got to sit back. And then the other question is, the other thing I, I, I will say is this is people say, for me, it was never woe is me. You know, it was, hey, why not me? You know what I'm saying? Why might why was I chosen? to have to go through this, you know? Now, mind you, people have gone through this, you know, one, two, three, you know, people have had numerous kidney transplants, but I just asked, you know, you asked the question, well, why me, you know? And for me, I believe a lot of this is so that I would have the opportunity to share my story with others so it could help them down the road because everybody's not talking about what they're going through. Everybody's not talking about what they're go, going through. And the last thing that I leave you with is this, is I don't look today physically like what I went through. So if I sat back and told you that I was battling kidney disease and I had multiple kidney transplants, you would have never known that throughout that process that I had lost 35 to 40 pounds. And my clothes were hanging out off my back. You wouldn't have noted I was having challenges walking because I had gout and was in the midst of my joints and it was hindering my ability to walk. You wouldn't have known that I was going to talk to customers and nobody shakes, shakes the left hand, but I couldn't shake the right hand because my hand was swollen like a softball, you know? But I just don't look like what I've been through, you know? And I know if, if nothing else, that's a story in itself to sit back and share with others. It's like, you know, you have the ability to overcome, but it goes back to do not allow the situation to overwhelm you. That is absolutely powerful. I mean, that's, and I, I, whenever I have someone as inspirational as yourself, like I like to ask that question about what would you tell someone else that's going through things? Because again, a lot of times we feel like we're alone. A lot of times we feel like, you know, everything is just too much, right? And then you talk about the why me, why me mentality. And it's not easy. 
you know it's not easy. And we all know it's not easy. But at the end of the day, you know, having the right motivation behind what you're doing can really transform the way you look at things and how you accomplish things. And again, your story is absolutely phenomenal and I love it. And I'm going to finish the show, ask this one question. How can my audience get a copy of your book or just learn more about your work? Well, my book is uh, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target. Uh, the name of the book is Triumph, Life on the Other Side of Trials, Transplants, Transition, and Transformation. Uh, the other place that you can look is, uh, and you can go on any site and actually find that there. And the other piece, the piece that I'm working through right now is uh, I got a website and we're in the process of, of standing up one more piece, but it's www.triumphwithgreg. Perfect. Tell me the website again. www.triumphwithgreg. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I will make sure that the website is in the show notes. So in the show notes, it's going to be zgl.com slash triumph. You knew that's how I was going to go with it. That's an easy one, right? Of course, the show notes are going to be in the description of the podcast. So you click underneath it, you get the show notes. You can um, you can find out more about Gregory, more about his journey. You can access his website, so on and so forth. And with that being said, we're out for the day. Gregory, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And that's it for Everyday Fam. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me.